On this session, you will learn about routing fundamentals for CCNA level. We will start by an introduction to routing. We will look at how packets are forwarded, TCP, RP model and ARP. We will also look at routing principles and routing protocols. And finally, in the second part, we will look at a demo lab where we will configure some routing on a few nodes. So let's get started. The primary function of a router is to forward packets from one interface or port to another. When a packet is received by a router, the router performs some checks, looks at the destination address on the received RP packet, and then based on that information, uses routing table to decide out of which interface should the packet be forwarded. Once that's established, the packet is forwarded out of the chosen interface. In this case, the packet is forwarding between PC1 to the internet. Let's start with a simple network where PC2 wants to send packets to PC3. So what needs to happen here? So on PC2, the application creates the data. The data is then pushed down to the transport layer where a TCP header is added. Here we have what we call a segment. This new data is pushed down to the network layer where an IP header is added. So here we have the packet. The packet is pushed further down to the data link where it will be encapsulated between a link header and a link trailer forming the frame. The frame is then pushed to the physical layer where it is transmitted. So this is where you have your bits going over the electrical wiring and so forth. When PC3 receives this bits, it will recreate the frame by going from the physical layer to the data link, decapsulate the data link to expose the RP packet for the network layer. From there, it is further decapsulated at the transport layer to expose the segment and from there on the application. So to recap, from the application going downwards, you start encapsulating your TCP or your transport header, your RP header for the packet and your data link, link header, and link trailer for the frame. This is then put onto the physical layer as bits hitting PC3, the opposite operation will take place. So here you start decapsulating from data link to network, to transport, to application. A key information here is what goes into this link header. PC2 needs to add the MAC address of PC3. At this point when PC2 is sending a packet to PC3, it does not have any knowledge on what is the MAC address of PC3. So, so this is where the address resolution protocol ARP comes into play. The link header must have the MAC address of PC3. So with ARP, PC2 sends the request, which is a broadcast, asking for the MAC address of 172.16.3.3. PC3 responds with unicast to PC2 with its own MAC address. So at this point, PC2 knows the MAC address of PC3, and that is what's inserted in the link header. As a key topic, the TCP model maps to the OSI model in the way that the application for the TCP RP model is actually the application layer on the OSI model, the presentation and the session. So these three layers on the OSI model, which is seven layers, maps to the application layer. Every other layer is a one-to-one -one mapping.
Now let's add to our previous simple network. So now we've added PC1 and the subnet between R1 and PC1 is 172.16.1.0. Router R1 has one interface, E0 on one subnet and E1 on the different subnet where PC2 and PC3 are connected. So when PC1 wants to send an RP packet to either PC2 or PC3, it knows its own RP address and it knows the destination address, which is, for example, PC of PC2, that would be the dot two. So that would be 172.16.3.2. So it knows that PC2 is not on the same subnet. So PC2 sends its packets destined for PC2 to its own default gateway, which happens to be R1 E0 interface. Let's call it or let's assign it a dot one. R1 receives the packet on its interface E0 and run two checks, a frame check sequence FCS and it checks whether whether the data link matches its own E0 MAC address. If these two pass the checks, then R1 will examine the destination RP address sent of the packet sent from PC1 and reference it to its routing table. So if this is the routing table on R1, R1 will look at the destination RP address sent from PC1. In this case, it would be 172.16.3.2. It doesn't have the exact, so it looks at the longest match. So what is the closest IP or subnet where the dot two would be? 172.16.3.0 is the matching subnet where PC2 would be. The mask is 24, so that is matching. The next hop is connected, so router one knows that this subnet is connected and it's not via another router. And the outgoing interface is E0. Packet received from PC1 destined to PC2, once it's passed these two checks, will be forwarded to PC2. An important or key topic here is PC1 being able to send packet to PC2 or R1 knowing a route to PC2 does not necessarily mean that PC2 would be able to send traffic back to PC1. In this particular case, if PC2 would be sending traffic back to PC1, we have to ask whether PC1 has a, or router one has a route for PC1. And here you can see that of course it does because it's directly connected. So here you will be able to have a two-way connectivity, full connectivity or two-way communication between PC1 and PC2. So adding more subnets, we now have PC4 directly connected to R2. PC1 sends a packet to PC4. As we saw earlier, the packet is sent to the default gateway, in this case is E0 of R1. R1 will run the checks, the frame check sequence, and also make sure that the MAC address in the data link is matching E0's MAC address. And after that, it will reference its routing table. So the destination RP address of the packet sent from PC1 is, for example, let's call it a dot four here. So the full address would be 172.16.4.4. Based on the routing table on R1, the next hop, so it doesn't have um, a directly connected um, network as we saw earlier, but it has a next hop, which is 172.16.2.2, which is effectively the other end of this point-to-point -point link. So this would be dot one, for example, and this would be your dot two. So, and it's reachable via E2. So R1 will just forward the packet received from PC1 to R2. Once received on E2, R2 will perform the exact same checks 
and reference its own routing table. And in this case, it will see that dot four or 172.16.40 slash 24, for example, as a subnet is directly connected via interface E0 and forwards the packet out of this interface to reach PC4. So now that we are getting the idea of routing, let's look at the routing protocols. Routing protocols can be dynamic or static. With dynamic routing, routing table is populated by the routing process enabled on the router. And through this process, each router learns new routes from adjacent neighbors, as well as advertise routes to them. So for example, you will have router one and router two, router three, and each have its own subnets. So say for example, you have three subnets here and you have two subnets here and one subnet here. So with whichever routing protocol, dynamic route protocol is used, this router R1 will advertise all these three subnets that it knows of to R2. R2 will advertise its own subnets plus the ones learned from R1 to R3. R3 will do the same, advertising its own subnet. R2 will advertise the new subnet learned via R3 and the two that it knows of back to R1. So in, in a nutshell, this is how dynamic routing protocols would work. So the routing table in each router is dynamically populated. On the opposite side, static routes are manually added on the router. So for example, again, router one has a host and so does router two. A static route could be added on router one to inform router one that reaching this subnet where the PC, PC2 is located has to be via this router. So the way you configure or you add static routes it's the format, the general or the generic format is root to subnet, mask, and then next hop destination. So you will have in the Cisco IOS, for example, the, the syntax will be IP, IP root, then comes the subnet and the mask, and then the next hop. So you defining how to go from R1 to a specific subnet statically. And this static routes come in different types. So you have a network route, which is essentially a subnet. So if you make any of you creating um, a route for this subnet, this will be a network route. If you're creating a route for a host, single host, and that will be a slash 32. So your in the syntax, you'll be 255, 255, 255, 255. So that will be a host static route. And then you will have a floating route. So the floating routes are slightly different. They could be either of these two. So it could be either a network route or host route, but you will have to add an admin distance to it. The default admin distance, and we will get into that in the lab, is one. And the lowest, or the lower the admin distance, the more preferred is this route. So connected admin distance. So for connected subnets, the admin distance is zero because there's no better route for a router than the one that is connected to it. You can't get any better than this. And then for the static routes, the admin distance is one. This is where you say from R1, if you want to go to R2's uh, whatever subnet, you need to go via R1. So this is your default admin distance. Now, in some cases, you will want to change this admin distance. You probably, you will have 
um, a dynamic routing protocol running here. So for example, we will be running OSPF where the admin distance is 110, but you want to use OSPF. If you leave things as they are, the static route will be the one taking effect in the routing table because it has a lower admin distance, but you would like to use OSPF instead. So what needs to happen is that you add in your syntax for the RP root, I'll put an example here, RP root 1.1.1.1 and then 255.000, next hop uh, X, you will add an admin distance that is higher than the OSPF one, so maybe you will use 150. So what happens is this route will be configured, but it's not taking effect. OSPF will be the routing protocol in effect. If anything happens with OSPF, say for example, there's a problem with the process, or you terminate OSPF yourself, or you remove it, then the static RP route will kick in. So because there's nothing for this route, apart from the static route, even with its admin distance of 150. So essentially this is the floating route. Now, default route is the route that you will use when you cannot find any specific route matching your destination. And we will create an example for every specific route here in the demo lab, so you get a full understanding of static routes. Now, dynamic routes, they come in different categories. You have the distance vector, and that would be your RIP version 2, for example. Advanced distance protocols, and that would be your ERGRP. And then you will have your link state protocols, and that would be your OSPF and ISIS, mostly used in service provider environments. So this kind of summarizes routing protocols at a very, very high level. You, can, you cannot go through routing protocols in one or two slides, but hopefully in the next session, which is the demo lab, we will get to grips with static routing and understand how they work. And we might also use some dynamic protocol like OSPF to validate the concept or to go through the concept of a floating static route. In the demo lab section, we will configure route 1 and R2 to support connectivity between the end hosts, as we can see in here, PC1, 2, 3, and 4.